see you all here tonight. We're excited about taking our study into Psalm chapter 58. We're going to be on a pattern here for the next couple of songs that uh, we're talking about. And so uh, I'd like for us to just stop and have a word of prayer and ask God's blessing on our time here together, if we may. Father, we come before you thanking you for the opportunity to be here in your house tonight. Lord, we pray that you might just bless our time together. And God, that you may quicken us with your word, that we may understand those things that you have written for our uh, edification to build us up. In Jesus' name, amen. If you look at this song, it starts out with a subtitle. And the subtitles are always important, but we sometimes don't think about those very much. But if you notice here in Psalm uh, chapter 58, it has the same subtitles that have been given earlier. But this, uh, it's to the chief physician, uh, uh, and it says here that it's Altersmith, uh, uh, and, and Altersmith means uh, uh, no or not or neither, or nothing, or work as a, as, a, as a preference, whatever. So when he starts out by talking about this uh, alt with, he's talking about this, there's some unworthy and some unnecessary things going on that need to be talked about. Then we've talked about before that this word, uh, talking about mipchon, is means, an engraving. So what David is doing right now is he's running from Saul. And as he's running from Saul, he has hidden himself in the cave at Adullam, like we had said before. And there in that cave, he is pretty limited in what it is that he can do. So he doesn't have what we would call pencil or pen or anything else. And so the indication here is that David was recording some of these thoughts and ideas that he had, and he was engraving them into the walls of the cave. He was writing them in there so that he would have them for remembrance and so that the others coming to join him would have those things that he had written there in the cave. So he was engraving them there. But there's another issue here, and we talk about this all the time, and that is that they need the words of God and the, the things that God does for us needs to be engraved on our heart, on the walls of our heart. And, you know, if you look at the Hebrew people, the Hebrew people had uh, text Bible verses at every station in their house, whatever door you went through, there was a Bible verse. If you went out the door, there was a Bible verse. And the scriptures teach us that we are to engrave the Word of God on our heart. So when you look at what this is being said and what he's talking about here, it's totally appropriate. You have to understand that David is on the run, right? Saul is after him. Saul is a king. And Saul as a king is taking his... Uh, place uh, as the king to a place where it was not a good thing. Saul was actually fixated on hunting down David. And he was hunting down David not because David had done any violence or because David had done any wrong, but rather there had been a jealousy that had been built in his heart and a hatred from that jealousy in his heart which brought him to the place of coming after David and coming after David Hart. So here's a king of a nation who's out after one man. And what can one man do? It's way out of line and out of proportion to what it should be. So as we begin to look at this song, we're going to be looking at some things about good and bad leadership. You know, one of the things that's really an amazing thing to me is how relevant the songs are today. Well, as we begin to look at this, and you begin to look at the world calendar, and you begin to look at the world events that are going on right now, you're going to find out that this is a critical thing for us to understand right now, to engrave on our hearts, 
and have in our memory and in our heart because it is relevant, absolutely relevant. Back in 1830, or rather 1384, uh, John Wycliffe wrote this, that the Bible is for the government of the people, by the people, and for the people. Some people will attribute that to Abraham Lincoln uh, in the Gettysburg Address, but the reality is that it precedes, <laughs> and actually, actually, Abraham Lincoln borrowed the line from a preacher in, uh, who was preaching on July the 4th in 1858, and in that uh, preaching and in that sermon, he used the phrase that John Wycliffe had already stated. So what he's doing is he's setting the criteria uh -oh. that leadership, valid, righteous leadership, needs to have its foundation in God Almighty and the Supreme God and the Supreme King, and then it has to be in accordance then to the Word of God. That's what needs to happen. David had this thought in his heart as he penned this song. While on the run from a vicious king, King Saul, he was there hiding in the cave at Adullam, and he was on, on a, in a bad way because there was no compassion in the heart of Saul for anything that was going on. So with this background in mind, let's take a look at the psalm if we might. Let's see what David has to say. And I want us to look at the first five verses as we look at this. He says, do you indeed speak righteous, O congregation? Do ye judge uprightly, O ye sons of men? Yea, in heart ye work wickedness. Ye weigh the violence of your hands in the earth. The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they be born, speaking lies. Their poison is like the poison of a serpent. They are like the deaf adder that stoppeth her ear, which will not hearken to the voice of the charmers. Charming never so wisely. So what do we have here? We have leadership. And, and this is, and I'm going to talk about this in a minute, but you have leadership at the top of the political spectrum, if you will, that is being, ex is being talked about here, okay? And we need to talk about good leadership versus bad leadership. What is the, the godly leadership look like? What is it supposed to do? And how is it supposed to act and react? There's always a contradiction between the godly and the ungodly leadership that we need to talk about. Now, when you read this in the King James Bible and you see the word congregation, don't, don't, uh, don't look at that like you do the other passages that have the word congregation. Because this word congregation here is a different word in the Hebrew text that was only used here only one time. And what does that word congregation mean? Well, the word congregation is a hlem, or hilem, which means silence, or mute, uh, to justice, in silence, or being silent. And so, when you look at this, the primitive root, or the beginning root, the etymology of the word, if you will, it starts out with the fact that it is to tie fast. Hence of the mouth for the tongue to be tongue-tied or tongue-bound, okay? To be done, to put to silence. So what is the psalmist saying here? What is he talking about the rulers? He says the rulers, this congregation or rulers, are behaving unwisely. They are not following God. They're not doing the thing that God would have them to do as rulers. They're doing some unjust things. You do you indeed speak righteousness. Well, they're done. They're not talking about the things of God. The things of God haven't entered into their heart or mind. They're not even about that. It's all about the political process and the thing that they want to do. 
It's not about be obeying God. It's not about loving God. It's not about being submissive to God. None of that is part of it. They are completely, completely and, and totally mute and silent about that. But even worse, and we see that today, that there are a lot of high-level politicians who will say things that it would lead you to believe that they are godly people when in fact they are not. They use the name of God or they'll use a scripture or they'll use something like that, but it's only there to get votes if some uh, speech writer has put that in there so that we can, as believers, can be sucked into their arena, to the thing that they want. And so that's what he's talking about here. They're silent about the things of God. These rulers, uh, they don't judge uprightly. They don't follow God. They don't listen to God. They don't care about God. All right? He says, in their heart, no. This word yay actually means no. In the heart, they work wickedness. They weigh the violence of your hands in the earth. Have you seen that recently? Have you seen the dictatorial relationship and the leaders uh, who have uh, gone out of the way to destroy and to create problems? Uh, G.K. Chesterton, a, a man that I like to read after, is a really good deep thinker, and he said this. He said the doctrine of original sin is the only philosophically that has been empirically validated by 3,500 years of human history. In other words, this word empirically means that there has been a completely uh, traceable course of history with repetition, repetition, repetition that cannot be not denied, okay, that the sinfulness of man and the way that man has dealt with its responsibility before God has been well established for 3,500 years. It's all there. Now that the fact of the matter is, is if you look at this passage of Scripture, if you look at what it says here, in verse number uh, 2, uh, he says, No, in heart you work wickedness. You weigh out the violence of your hands in the earth. So what are they? They're violent people, right? These leaders are violent people. They will do anything to stay in charge. Isn't that what Saul was doing? Saul was spending his time running after one man when he's a king of a great nation. And he would have, and he killed a lot of people who were innocent people who had nothing to do with this, right? Because of his, because of his hatred for one man. Because something got stuck in his craw, so to speak. So here he is chasing these people. Now look what he says uh, later on here. He says, the wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they are born, speaking lies. So what we're going to do is, is we're going to look at the political leaders, and that's what David is doing here. He's talking about those unpolitical, those political leaders who are doing ungodly things and why they do them. And what does it look like? Well, if you look at this, you'll, rem you'll remember that when we are born into the world, when we are born, all of us, right, are born sinners. The origin of sin. We, we are all born sinners. David acknowledges that in Psalm chapter 51 and verse 5. What does he say? He says, Behold, I was shaped in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. So we, as human beings, all of us are born into this world alienated from God with a sinful nature. With a the sinful nature that will not only destroy us, but given full head of steam will destroy others as well. And so those who have 
sinful natures who have not been converted, those who are not following God, are going to follow the resources of the flesh. And following the resources of the flesh, they're going to stay in power and they're going to expand their power. They're going to exercise their power because that's who they are. If you think about all the wars that we've had in our, in our history, uh, World War II in particular, world dominance, right? The Nazi government, uh, headed by Adolf Hitler, was trying to subjugate the whole world into the idea of their Nazism and their beliefs and their theology that came along with that. And it took millions of lives in the process of it. Some five million Jews alone. This is, this is wickedness at its height. And when you have that in a place of leadership, you have a real problem. Notice what it says in Romans chapter uh, 3 and verse 10. Paul talks about this. He says, as it is written, there is not righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. Now I want you to think about this in terms of the natural man's birth. And then think about that in terms of leadership. He's going to lay out, Paul is going to lay out here in these verses, what the sinful nature will do. And how it acts and what it looks like. So that we can wrap our mind around it. He first of all says, they're not righteous. Why? Because they're like David was. Like all of us are. We were born sinners, right? We didn't inherit sin by doing something that was sinful. We do something that was sinful because we're sinners. That's our nature. Until something changes that nature. He says here in verse 11 of Romans chapter 3, There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh out to God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. The Bible tells us very clearly that if we're living in a sinful state and our lives have not been transformed by the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, even those things, and this is, this is offensive to a lot of people, but I've I, I got to tell you this, that even the good things that we think we have done in the eyes of God are not good. Why? Because it fell in the first part of what it is to be a person that has been created and allowed to have life by a holy God, and we've turned our back on holy God, and he's the one who originated our life, and so when we are doing those deeds that are apart from him, right, and apart from his influence in our lives, as far as he's concerned, it is, the Bible says that it's evil. He said that he is angry with the wicked every day. So there, that's the condition that the lost are in. What does he say? In verse 12, they have gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. There's that phrase again. Repeat it again. Now what does he go on to say? He says their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. In other words, they don't tell the truth. Right? You know, it's, it, and, and I'm sorry to say this, and I don't mean to be political here, but a lot of our leadership today is not truthful. They tell the truth as they see it, not the truth as it is. And sometimes there could be a large difference between those two. And so that's the world we live in. The poison of asps in their lips. In other words, it's poison. The things that they say are not true, and the truth is, if you're behind the scenes, many of them know when they say it, it's not true. But they have to say that to retain their power, to get the influence and the political pressures that, they, that are around them. What did you say in verse 14? Whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. What else is going on with these guys? How can you identify them? Their feet are swift to shed blood. Have you seen that in leadership? Have you seen that they, they don't care about human life? That human life is not a big deal to them? Yes. 
We've seen it over and over again, haven't we? Notice this, destruction and misery are in their ways. Have you seen those leaders who have turned their back on God, who don't acknowledge God, who don't listen to God, who go out and destroy and wreak havoc and create war and kill innocent people and tear up buildings and tear up places and towns? Have you seen that? You know you have. Because destruction is what they're about. They will destroy anything and any person who stands in the way of what it is that they want to do. That's what they will do. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no, here's the problem, here's the root right here. There is no fear of God before their eyes. You know what? This Bible says that there's coming a reckoning day, isn't there? There's going to come a day when all of those high leaders, those who've led people, who've done all these deeds, are going to stand before God Almighty, and the Bible says they're going to be there without excuse. And their high position and all the political and all the things that they did while they were here on earth will not matter before Holy God. What will matter is, did they listen to God? Did they hear God's voice? Did they follow God's ways? Did they live the way that God would? Have them to. So David is talking about this leadership that is going on in his day. The thing that's happening, I think if you think about it, we can relate very well to that today. Notice what he says here in verse number six. He says, Break their teeth in their mouth, O God. So now then, judgment is sought. David just delineated and talked about what this leadership, this ungodly leadership is all about, what it looks like, what it's doing. And Saul had been a part of all of that. Saul had, and his army had done those things in search of one man, David. So they were guilty of that. So David is coming and saying, now then, Lord, I need you to Take charge here. I need you to do something. What's he say in verse 6? He says, Break their teeth, O God, in their mouth. Break out the great teeth of the young lions, O Lord. Well, what's the fiercest thing about a lion? Well, it's their teeth, right? And huge teeth, they can render a person lifeless in just a few seconds with their teeth, the strength in their jaw and in their teeth there. So, first thing David says is pull their teeth. <laughs> Take the power away from them. Let them melt away as waters which continually, when he bendeth his bow to shoot the arrow, let them be cut in pieces. And so there again, he goes back and says, look, Lord, I, this is just, they're tearing these things up, they're doing these evil deeds. And what he's talking about here is a mountain, see, where the snow caps melt and the waters come down suddenly from the side of the mountain. It's like a gushing stream that comes and it wipes out everything in its path along the way. So he said, let them be like the rivers, let them be the waters that roll down the hill that take out everything in its path. Destroy those works that are done that are going to hurt and kill and maim people. And as the snail melts away, every one of them pass away, like a timely birth of a woman, that they may not see the sun. Before your pots can feel the thorns, he shall take them away as a with a whirlwind, both living and in his wrath. So what is the psalmist doing? He is not seeking. Let me make this clear. Because there's a lot of folks that have this. The Bible talks about forgiving those who sin against us. The Bible talks about praying for those people who uh, abuse us and use us and accuse us. Talks about all that. So what David's saying here seems to be contradictory to what you and I might think we understand. But what David is saying here is not that. What the psalmist is not seeking a personal revenge, 
for the things that these ungodly, this ungodly leadership and, and Saul and his army and his captains and all those have done to him. He's not talking about that. What is he talking? He's asking God, as I said a few moments ago, to limit their power and to take the power away from them. To stop the violence, basically. Well, is that appropriate? Well, yes. You know, we have a responsibility as God's people. When we see violent things being done, and we see in our culture those things that are not right, and we see those unholy things going on, and those awful things going on, and they're doing that in the name of Jesus sometimes, and they're doing it sometimes without His name, but we have a responsibility as His children to rise up against that, don't we? Should we not pray that God would stop the violence? Should we not pray that God would deliver people? That somehow, some way, God would intervene and work His marvelous grace and mercy in these lives to stop the needless shed of blood? Well, of course, that's what David is doing here. He said we need to pull the teeth. We need to, we need to flush out all of these things. We need, to take, we need to take the power away from them so that we can rejoice in the peace of God Almighty. Alexander McLaren said this. He said it's a, it is a homily, when he's talking about these bad verses of Scripture we've just been talking about, it's a homily or an admission, an admonition or a sermon, if you will. Okay? And therefore, vigorous picture of half accomplished plan suddenly reduced to failure and leaving their concocters hungry for the satisfaction that seems so near. So what is it they're trying to accomplish? Well, the things they're trying to accomplish is more wickedness, is it not? It's to create a world without God. It is to create a world where they are God, right? Isn't that what Pharaoh did? Isn't that what all of these world leaders in the past over the last 3,500 years have done? They've tried to stand in the place declaring themselves as God because all of the people have been subjugated to them and being subjugated to them, they have risen themselves up as God and Nebuchadnezzar tried the same thing, didn't he? What did God do to him? He sent him out in the field to eat grass like a like an animal, right? You see, the thing is, is their power needs to be limited. And God left Nebuchadnezzar in that state until Nebuchadnezzar come to his senses and said, there is a God in heaven that I'm accountable to. A radical change happened in his life. Here's the fact. God is on his throne. He will set things right. It will happen. God will take this leadership that has uh, been violent, that has killed and maimed and destroyed and hurt and created misery and pain. God one day will settle the accounts. Adolf Hitler killed himself because he couldn't face the world that he had thought that he had created. And he did violence on himself because he couldn't he couldn't live in the world that he could not have. Think about it. All of these world leaders who espoused that they were going to become great and they were going to take over the world, they're all gone. Some by their own hand. Now notice what we see here in verses 10 and 11 as we look at the scripture. First of all, I think there's a really important verse that we need to wrap our mind around as we talk about this. In the book of Proverbs in chapter 21 and verse 1, it says this. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. As the rivers of water, he turneth it whithersoever he will. When it's all said and done, when it comes right down to the final deal, God is in control. Listen, 
these guys that are doing these wicked, these wicked deeds and doing all these terrible things in the leadership positions and abusing the leadership positions they have, they're not going to get away with it. And they are not working under God's permissive will either. Well, that's just the way it is. God, God knows about it. No! God is against it. God hates it. God is angry with it. He's going to let them come to their end. He's going to let the, the wrath and iniquity fill the cup till it's completely full. And then when it's completely full and they think they are about to get what they want, and Alexander, Alexander McLaren said, I'm going to shut them down. We'll lose it all. God will not tolerate. And God is not letting these people work under a permissive will system. He is absolutely against it. He was against King Saul. He rejected him as king. He was going to replace him. And David was his replacement. Saul was not. was not going to get away with it. And Saul was going to be held accountable for every one of the vicious, terrible things that he did. By the way, how did Saul die? Does anybody remember? He fell on his own sword. He committed suicide. How are the mighty fallen, right? God brought an end to his reign because he let the wickedness fill the cup and, the, and God just absolutely ended it. Just brought him to his end and he used the Philistines to do it. Notice what he says here in verses 10 and 11. The righteous shall rejoice when he seeth the vengeance, and he shall wash his feet in the blood of the wicked, so that man shall say, Verily, there is a reward for the righteous. Verily, he is God that judges in the earth. So what, is it, what does it come down to this? It comes down to this. That the just will be vindicated. Now, he uses some rather some rather uh, artistic ways of expressing it here about the blood of the wicked. He washed his feet in the blood of the wicked. Boy, that's a powerful statement, isn't it? Who washes his feet in the blood, the blood of the wicked? Jesus. You say, boy, that's gruesome. Well, you need to read the book of the Revelation and you need to read the book, in the book of the Revelation where it talks about Gog and Magog, right? Y'all remember any of that? Where the blood is running through the valley there up to the horse's bridles. And who did that? Not God's army, but the Spirit of the Lord did that with the word of his mouth. He destroyed that complete army in just a few seconds. God doesn't need the machinery. He doesn't need an atomic bomb. He doesn't need anything else. All he needs to do is say it and it's done. And God says the wicked will pay a supreme price. There's coming a day when the wickedness will no longer flourish. There's coming a day when I will set things right. There's coming a day when their power will be relinquished. There's coming a day when they will no longer be powerful. There's coming a day when they will no longer hunt people down and treat them the way that they have. There's coming a day when they will not slaughter people anymore or destroy anymore. I'm going to put an end to it, God said. In his own time. And when we see the hand of God working to stay the wickedness and violence in the earth, what will the righteous do? They will rejoice. Will they not? Should they? Absolutely. They should rejoice in the curtailing and the dismantling and the tearing up of those wicked ways and those wicked things that the wicked men and the wicked leadership does. All of their lies and all of their fairy tales and all of the things that they had hoped for and tried to accomplish by trying to do the things that they did, they'll come to naught before Almighty God, whomever they may be. 
He says verily twice there. When you see the word verily, you should remember that is absolutely surely. Surely, surely. This is what's going to happen. This is what God said, not me. This is what God said. He is God that judges in the earth. Doesn't sound like God is just kind of step back and watching it happen, is it? That ain't the way it works, guys. There's coming a day when the leadership and the righteousness of Almighty God is going to come forward. One day, the Lamb that was slain upon the cross, according to this book, will rise up as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He will be on a white charger. And he will have his name that nobody knows written upon his hip. And on that day, he will set all the accounts right. And we who are in his army, who are in the army behind him as we witness the power of the Lamb, as we witness the majesty of God, will shout out off of our horses, Hallelujah! Praise the Lord! I'm looking forward to that day. I want to tell you something, guys. David is in a terrible mess. But he knows that there's a king of kings and a lord of lords. And in the end, he's going to set the account straight. Saul may be having his heyday for today, but it's only for a day. Because there's going to come a day when God is going to say, I've had it. That's enough. And it's going to close the book on Saul's life forever. The wicked do not prosper in the way. It may seem as though they do, but they do not. God is God, and those who follow him will be victorious. That doesn't mean that they won't have to fight a battle. It doesn't mean that they won't have suffering along the way. It doesn't mean any of that. But I'll tell you, when it comes to the end of the road, the people of God will be victorious. David has suffered. We've studied about his suffering in the last several psalms. He suffered tremendously. But listen, there's coming a day when the suffering that David is going through will be over. We still talk about David today, don't we? As a king. As a mighty king. And all the things that God did at his hand. His name is lived forever. His name is high and lifted up. But Saul is forgotten. And all of them like him. Have died and placed in the ground. And are remembered no more. But the righteous. <laughs> the righteous are remembered forever. Oh listen, take courage folks. We live in a world that is all messed up. We live in a world where leadership has not sought out God, has not listened to God, in my opinion, and I'm entitled to that. They have not followed hard after God. They have not listened to God's word. They have not obeyed God. They have gone off on their own dictatorial uh, things and as the dictators that they've become and the harms and the lies. Listen, there's coming a day where the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords is going to set all that straight. It's going to happen. So we can take courage in the days as we look at the world and the lives that we live. If you think this psalm isn't appropriate, turn on the evening news. You'll find out that it's very appropriate because people have not changed. Civilization has not changed. And there always will be those who rise up to try to destroy that which is righteous and good and right. But in the end, they go away. In a few years, nobody will know who these men were. They will have forgotten their names. All those who murdered people who took the name of Jesus, those who were in the ISIS, and those who were in those, those kind of things and were murdering people left and right, their names will be forgotten. 
that those who gave their names and their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ will be remembered forever. We need to remember that. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your love. And God, I'm not on a political theme here tonight. I'm just talking about what David went through and all the criteria that happened with him and his life. And Lord, we look around at our scene today, the, the thing that's going on, and Lord, we see it happening over and over again. And God, help us as God's people to fall on our faces. And God, help us to beseech you before the throne that you might change this world that we live in and bring it to a place of righteousness. Lord, that the slaughter of innocence may stop, that the destruction may cease. Lord, pull the teeth and lessen the power of those who promote evilness and wickedness in our culture today. God, lift us up. Help us to be courageous. Help us to stand true to your word. And God, help us to live as we are as the children of God and who are under the authority of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords in our lives. God, help us to walk with you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.